Today is April 18th, 2019. Yeah. Okay, chapter 14. The scope of catalytic, catalactic problems. Mm -hmm. Human action. So, the way I understand this chapter is the very beginning was the setup for um, explaining why coming up with imaginary economies is useful. Yes. And then the later in the chapter, they um, he talks about you know stationary economies, um, other and then what was it? Con economies in constant rotation. So I think the the most confusing part to me was at the beginning of the chapter when they're setting up talking about these imaginary economies and. It was really hard to kind of comprehend that beginning, like the the theory why it's useful to imagine these scenarios. Well, here's what Robert Murphy summarizes about the chapter at the very end. Why it matters, he says. <clears throat> In this very important chapter, Mises explains the subject matter of catalactics, which is a subset of the field of praxeology. This is what most people have in mind when they talk of economics. Mises also discusses the specific method that the theoretical economist must use, namely imaginary constructions. Finally, Mises describes one of the more important imagery constructions, imaginary constructions, especially the evenly rotating economy. In essence, Mises lays out this chapter, in this chapter, the boundaries of his subject and describes the tools he will use to analyze it. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that's why it came off so heavy, because it's like, here we go. This is like, we've, I've built the foundation and now all that other stuff that I've talked about is being human action. Not everyone agrees that that's economics, but when we're talking about economics, it's this one subset, which Mises calls catalactics, and it involves a lot of imaginary things that you can't exactly put your finger on. Before, he was talking about, like, definite things that you can put your finger on, and now he's like... Like, one of the examples in the imaginary construction that he used, which was kind of amazing and beautiful, was about uh, if there was no if there was perfect knowledge of what, um, when people would need their money, then people could make out loans that they would collect the day of in the exact amount that they needed, and people would have no use for, like, actual money itself, just a unit of accounting between each other. Mm -hmm. Which was like, that's of, of course impossible, we don't know the future and what's gonna happen, things in flux, but... I could see how that's useful in economics you want to make a prediction of what, how much you'll need at a certain time. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an imaginary construction. So I guess we should get into it. Okay. Uh, number one, the delimitation of catalactic problems. How does economics classify action? Well... Sounds like he's looking for a specific answer. Mm. Economics classify actions so in kind of the chapter summary, it says economics is mainly concerned with the analysis of money prices in the real world are formed for all goods and services exchanged on a market. So if economics is mainly concerned with money prices and exchange, Well, I would, okay, so I'm going to wager a guess as to what the answer is here. This is, <clears throat> if 
if Mises describes human action as always trying to um, reduce a um, discomfort by thinking of what will reduce it and then taking an action to reduce it, mm -hmm. then economics perhaps classifies actions as um, <clears throat> those things humans do to <coughs> um, improve their <coughs> state uh, in economic terms, in terms of money. So mm -hmm. all other things being equal, a guy will sell grain to the, the person who's offering the highest price, thus bringing about the greatest um, <coughs> satisfaction to the producer, to the mm -hmm. seller, uh, as possible. So I would, I would say <coughs> economics classifies actions as things that humans do, trades that humans make to increase their mm -hmm. individual profit. Okay. What is the field of study of cattle ethics? So that's, is that economics? Yeah, I would say that it's the economic subset of human action, yeah. of praxeology. Why, it's the study of why humans do what they do in economic term, in um, economic terms. In terms of money. So mm -hmm. what is economics and what should it examine? So. Economics is mainly concerned with the analysis of how money prices in the real world are formed for all goods and services exchanged on a market. Yeah. Because there's all kinds of human action and ways yeah. we want to increase our individual mm -hmm. satisfaction, but not all of them are in money terms. Right. Economics is. How does scarcity influence human action? Oh, this was really cool. <clears throat> I thought it was bizarre that Mises says... If uh, like aliens were, if, if we were to encounter a, a universe where um, there were no scarcity, then humans would uh, become dumber because we don't need to think. And mm -hmm. thinking is a creation or a result of scarcity in the first place. Um, was, was was a really fascinating statement. I've never considered that. Uh, but scarcity influences human action because it forces us to think. We have to mm -hmm. imagine how we can maximize our limited resources to bring about the most satisfaction to ourselves. Cool. Two, the method of imaginary constructions. Again, here's a comment. An imaginary construction is a conceptual image of a sequence of events logically evolved from the elements of action employed in its formation. So, why must we use imaginary constructions in praxeology? And this was a really technical, I think, part. It's really hard to understand. I think just in, in basic terms, because it's, it's like how geometry can have perfect answers, but you'll never really have that in real life because you can't have perfect measurements and stuff. Um, similarly, in economic or in the study of catalactics, you can have imaginary uh, predict like certainty, um, but in the real world things are always changing and you're never going to be totally exact. I like this reason in the summary: the economists cannot use experiments as the physicist or chemist can choose among his theories. So, you know, the chemist can always, you know, have his lab experiment and determine that, but. You, economics, you really have to do the thought experiments because you can't actually implement your hypothesis or test it. Right, that makes sense because uh, conditions are always changing, like a physicist or a chemist. Right, can... or you could, I mean, they can't just make a socialist society <laughs> and see, like, if it does that one thing they're trying to, like, determine. Right. I mean, yeah. maybe, maybe you could, like, spawn societies, like, mini from like bacteria or something and sure, but make them socialist. <laughs> yeah, and maybe in a, in, in a computer model because yeah. Mises even makes the argument here that in socialist economies, they still claim, they're like, oh, well, there's other places that aren't socialist yet, so we can't have our perfect utopia. So it's like, 
they can still fault the environment, even if they have a, a socialist economy. They're like, oh. So, I guess this is the first imaginary experiment. The pure market economy. Is the market obstructed by institutional factors? So, this would be no. The definition of the pure market economy, I believe, like, would be that there is no institutional factors. What is, what is meant by institutional factors, I wonder? So I believe it talked about, you know, a force like a government using coercion. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so... The idea behind this experiment is that there is none, and then the experiments come when you introduce an intervention. So it's like, let's imagine this pure market economy, and let's impose an uh, income tax. Mm -hmm. And then the experiment is to kind of think of how does that income tax affect this pure market economy. So that would be an institutional factor obstructing the market. Right. So is the market obstructed by institutional factors? Shouldn't the answer be yes? So the setup for the experiment, no, because it's a pure market economy. And then the hypothesis is if an income tax were to be imposed on this um, economy with no institutional factors, if we add one in, how does it change? Mm. Okay, but that change would be an obstruction, right? Right. So it's kind of a weird... I think it's a weirdly worded question. They're talking about a, a pure market economy. Is the market obstructed? No. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. But and the experiments introduce... The point introduce these obstructions. Hmm. Okay. In what sense can we say that men are always seeking the maximization of profit? The maximum. Well, this was like the uh, point that I made earlier that if you have, it's uh, like a priori, it's, it's just like inarguable, but all other things being equal, a man will choose to sell his product to the highest offer, you know. Right, but that's not necessarily true. So it's not just price. There's They talk about giving alms to a friend. Yeah, but that's all other things being equal. So those are not, those things would not be equal. Oh, okay. Like, oh, this guy really needs a job, and um, the capitalist is like, oh, I'm going to... Um, or what was the example of is someone who is hungry um, and then serving other people food first uh, is the elimination of that person's uh, discomfort that is felt by other yeah. the empathy of other people being hungry. Right. So I don't think that ne they necessarily sell to the highest. Using that logic, let's say I'm selling a car. I could maybe get an extra hundred dollars from a stranger, or I could sell it to a friend for a hundred dollars less. Yeah. And maybe I'll ch choose to sell it to my friend because the satisfaction of selling something to my friend is more than the hundred dollar difference. Yeah, but if person A and person B were like blank faces that you didn't know, total strangers from the same town, from the same everything, Mm -hmm. Same income bracket and all of that. If they were exactly the same, but one was making a higher offer, you're going to go with the higher offer just as a rule. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't make sense to do otherwise. Men are always seeking the maximization of profit. In what sense is it absolutely adequate to speak of selfishness when it comes to the question of human action? Men are always acting selfishly. In all things, even in charity. Mm -hmm. And as g the example given, like, when someone else is hungry, the satisfaction of feeding them is the elimination of your own 
wants to be more comfortable knowing that yeah. strangers are fed. That makes sense to me. I kind of thought of something for a while. Like, it seems like selfishness is being used in two different ways. Like, we're using the same word because, you know, you, if you give your food away to someone hungry, someone would call that selfless. Yeah, but it's not. But in in some way, it it is, but it's not. I think it, they're so, using the term incorrectly. So the, yeah, so it's like there maybe there's like a selfish probably has two multiple different. It's used in different ways, I think. Yeah, well, Ayn Rand wrote a book called *The Virtue of Selfishness*, mm -hmm. and in which she explains that the, this very um, what do you call it dictum that yeah. is men always are acting in their self-interest every time. Mm -hmm. So like then there's no such thing as selflessness. I think a better term would be foolishness. Mm -hmm. When you act out, <laughs> when you act in not your best interest, that's just foolishness. But that's you know? still selfish, because you're acting, like, because you're still acting. <sighs> Good point. So that's why I think there's kind of two definitions of selfish, selfish here. Okay, and what's the first? So... You know, it doesn't matter which order. So one is like s selfish in the fact that everything I do is for my own self-interest. Okay. And then I think there's maybe so that maybe that's interpersonal selfish, and then there is a like selfish from maybe third party perspective, mm. where you help others instead of yourself. Is it? That's the another term type yeah. of selfishness. Yeah, or I guess that's selflessness. Oh, you help okay. yourself over others. The selfless selfishness. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah, I just, I just, I think that's there. Maybe there's a shortcoming in human language. Yeah, at or least in English. The English language. So there's a selfish selfish and a selfless selfish. <laughs> Is that right? I guess. I guess from an interpersonal perspective and then maybe a, a third party observer. Okay, that makes sense. Why do the terms fair or unfair imply value judgments? Is what is fair? To define fair is my fair might be different than your fair. Yeah. So um, it's a value judgment. Yeah, if I say, uh, you know, $1,000 for this car, that's fair. And you're like, uh, are you kidding me? That's like at least a $12,000 car. Mm -hmm. That's totally unfair if there's a value judgment uh, applied to each of those. Does a pure market economy exist? Does the answer affect the conduct of economics. I want to say there's no, because there's some, a lot of these imaginations, there's contradictions that you kind of have to ignore. But I don't know the exact answer. What's weird is, I, I, can't, fi I can't find a totally accurate answer to this question, because on the one hand I would say, no, a pure market economy does not exist because there are all these government interferers, mm -hmm. you know, busybodies saying, oh, you can't build here, or you need a special permit for that, or this is going to be taxed to this level here. So, no, the, those are interferences in the market. But on the other hand, the market routes around that damage and includes those factors in pricing decisions. So... Right, but that's not pure market because it's having to kind of morph around those rules. But why are they not considered participants in the market? Because they're using coercion. Ah, right. Yeah, they're not using just prices and, and selling and buying. Mm -hmm. They're using guns. Yeah. Okay, and cages. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Does the answer affect the conduct of economics? Well... I 
again, I'm unsure of this answer because yeah, y yeah, a businessman has to decide: um, Am I going to um, produce X or Y? Given that uh, this is uh, X is regulated to this extent and Y is regulated to that extent, so <clears throat> those. I think I'm gonna have to go back and reread this part because I think three. to to answer this, you really need to <clears throat> perfectly understand what a pure mar market economy is. And I don't think I'm there yet. Well, let's like check out the the summary here. I mean, they've got. I don't think it can exist because, so, let's take the example of selling the car, mm -hmm. um, and you said if, you know, person A versus person B with blank faces, same everything, yeah, same connection, like, everything, and that, yeah. that can't exist, uh, right. because yeah. there's variation, <clears throat> right? like, it could be something, as far as I just like person A or person A is maybe better looking or something like <laughs> right so yeah. so you can't like a pure like I think everyone would have to be completely anonymous with no interpersonal connection and live in a complete silo and have like same credit score same like, yeah same well I don't think no not same credit score because it because I don't think that everyone has to be the same yeah, but I think they I, have to be anonymous. But what if I'm if I'm choosing between two buyers on a dark market, or two vendors? I want the one with a, a higher rating. So right. Like, so that's, even though they're anonymous. Right, but that's still uh, that's a still a pure commodity because men are always going to have different skills. I think it's the interpersonal connection or my own biases. Mm. Maybe that affect the pure market. But uh, I could be totally off. Well, I, I want, yeah, all right, interesting. Part four, the autistic economy. Why must economics study the situation of an isolated economic actor? So I'm just going to read the short summary. Please. In order to understand interpersonal exchange, Economics must analyze autistic exchange, such as when an isolated individual exchanges less satisfactory for more satisfactory conditions without, without interacting with other people. <laughs> well, that wasn't helpful. They didn't say why. Well, I would, I would wager to say that the autistic economy is the beginning of the economy mm -hmm. itself because... Uh, all economic decisions are made by individuals, so the most individual economic exchanges that can exist are autistic economic exchanges. Right, like a, a lumberjack going down, cutting down a tree for his fire firewood that night. Yeah, or s sitting on a log and whittling some wood, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like it produces no economic activity to the individual, and it may pr it may ha take the same labor inputs, but s sawing a piece of wood in your hand versus sawing a piece of wood down in the forest is like way more economically beneficial to the autistic economy, and therefore to the greater economy eventually. Mm -hmm. The state, of, part five, the state of rest and the evenly rotating economy. Now, this part really blew my mind. Um, what is the plain state of rest? Why isn't it an imaginary construction? Okay, well, now I'm really confused because I kind of thought it was. What I thought the plain state of rest was is um, like that situation where 
I described earlier that um, everyone knows what to expect and economic activity is sort of like at a, a homeostasis. Let's see. Okay, so basically the plane state of the, I guess, so the, the plane state of rest is maybe, let's say when the markets are closed and, you know, if you're looking at like an order book, all the people willing to sell at a certain price have sold. Ah, uh, right. And okay. all the buyers looking to buy. It's when there's a spread on the order book. When the, there's no buyers at a certain price and there's no sellers at a certain price. Everyone's happy the way it is. Not necessarily happy. They there's no one else willing to exchange to make them more happy. Oh. So it's like you know maybe I'm selling. Um, a Bitcoin for ten thousand dollars, but no one's willing to buy it until for six thousand dollars. Then <laughs> no one, yeah. Then um, it's a we're in the plain state of rest because I'm not willing to sell for less, and they're not willing to buy for more. That makes sense. It says uh, a plain state of rest is not an imaginary construction. It happens whenever there are no transactions. Because no buyer wishes to acquire more units of the good or service at the price necessary to induce a seller to surrender more units. The plain state of rest is only transitory. It will be disrupted whenever preferences change and mutually advantageous exchanges once again exist. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. Excuse me a minute. I'd like to silence the interruptions. Is that the Discord? Uh, it sounds like... I don't know exactly. So what is the final state of rest? And I think that's what you described earlier. It's when everyone's happy. Oh, yeah, oh, perfect like, yeah. satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So that's imaginary. Yes. What distinguishes the market price from the final price? Hmm. Ah, okay. Um on the other hand, the final state of rest is indeed an imaginary construction. It refers to the situation in which all of the effects of a particular disturbance have run their course, and the price in question has reached its final price. If a new report causes half of the smokers to quit cold turkey, a plain state of rest in the cigarette market will soon emerge at a much lower price. However, as cigarette manufacturers scale back their operations, and the glut of inventory is reduced to the new level, appropriate for the cutting customers, a new final price will emerge that may be higher or lower than the previous final price, depending on its specifics. So, hmm, I don't know how that... So I think the market price is kind of just... Because to get to uh, a final price, you have to go through like different prices. Yeah. So I think the market price is just where it's at along the curve. So a final price is sort of like the description of the price at a relative equilibrium. Yeah, when that. it's going like sideways. 
mm. which is still a market price, but once it once that equilibrium changes, then it's no longer a final price, but it's still a market price. So it's uh, the price once all the disturbances in the yeah. market are accounted for. Yeah. Like people are like, oh, BSB is is delisted from such and such exchange, the price drops and then it goes sideways, that's mm -hmm. the new final price, mm -hmm. once accounted for the disturbance. Mm -hmm. Okay. What distinguishes the final state of rest from the evenly rotating economy? Well, the evenly rotating economy, or ERE, is the imaginary construction in which all prices have reached their final prices. Okay, so the final state of rest would be there are still no transactions. There's no transactions. Everyone's happy. Yeah. The evenly rotating economy, people are still transacting, but it's just some type of like equilibrium. Right. So the final state of rest is no transactions are happening, rest, mm -hmm. and then evenly rotating transactions are happening, mm -hmm. but prices aren't changing. So they both have that prices aren't changing, but... One has no activity. Mm -hmm. What is the driving force of the whole market system? It, it has to be human desire. Yeah, it's got to be the uh, elimination of discomfort, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that the foundation? By individuals. Of, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, maybe that's... What is the driving force of the whole market system? Yeah, individuals working to uh, eliminate discomfort. Okay, so why is it not necessary to hold cash in a world without change and uncertainty? I think we were talking about this earlier. Mm hmm. Because you can use units of account um, instead of cash, uh, because you know the exact amount, let's see, in a world without change and certainty, you know exactly how much you're going to need at a certain time, and so you can trade units of account with each other rather than um, having cash on hand to, to account for the discrepancies, mm -hmm. the things that you didn't expect. Why is the mathematical method to which Mises refers not suited to convey any knowledge? Why is the mathematical method to which Mises refers not suited to convey any knowledge? Suppose, um, gosh, I don't know exactly. Because they don't take into effect, uh, into account, like individual value judgments. I'd say, because um, yeah, like pure m mathematics doesn't express, you know how important it is to me that you know I sell to a friend versus or give a friend a job versus hire you know someone else at like market price that makes sense hmm but you know M Mises describes a situation where some people prefer things that are worse 
um, I don't know how he determines what, how they're worth, but I guess you make the point it's about a value judgment. Some people may value a really bad painting. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, okay, that's what they value. Mm -hmm. um, or even that... Uh, yeah, they did talk like sentimental value. Yeah. Yeah. The stationary economy. What distinguishes the stationary economy from the evenly rotating economy? So it's where wealth and income of individuals remain constant. Ah, so an even, an, what is it called? Evenly rotating economy? What's the ERE? They can change, but they change proportionally. So, like, if you, you know, make $100,000 less, in turn, maybe I'll make $100,000 more, and I'll buy the same products that you bought. <laughs> the um, RE is really hard to comprehend <clears throat> because it's, like, so many factors just in equilibrium. Right. That makes sense. Uh... Robert Murphy writes in his summary here, an evenly rotating economy is stationary, but a stationary economy need not be an evenly rotating economy. So wealth and income is constant in an evenly rotating economy and in a stationary economy. But Wealth and income need not be constant in an evenly rotating economy. They can change, as you just described. Hmm. Okay, it's an interesting thought experiment. Yeah. Yeah, so the stationary economy where profits and losses equal each other. Part seven, the integration of catalactic functions. What is the role of the promoter in economics? So I thought of the promoter as the leader, the entrepreneur. What do they, they have a term for that, uh, the market, um, I don't know, the trendsetters? Mm -hmm. Is that the same word you think the in this context? The promoters are like the people who drive. They're like, I go get an iPhone, and I'm the first one to get an iPhone, and then everyone wants an iPhone. Yeah, I think so. Okay. What is the role of the promoter in economics? I don't know exactly, but mm -hmm. I'm guessing <clears throat> that the role of the promoter in economics is to be the <clears throat> one of the drivers of um, value judgment, and and therefore uh, people's economic decisions to prefer an iPhone over an Android or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, what is the role of an entrepreneur in a stationary economy? Hmm. Okay. So, stationary economy is where profits equal losses. This is, so, individually, does that... I would almost say a... An entrepreneur... 
entrepreneur might be selfish in a stationary economy because all the profits they make come at the expense of someone's loss because it's stationary. So it's kind of a socialist idea. Oh, right. Interesting. So the entrepreneur is technically like evil because all the profits they make come from the losses at someone's expense. In a stationary economy. Although yeah. in a stationary economy isn't isn't doesn't the person who is losing, so to speak, isn't that also constant for them? I mean No. I so above it says a per um Stationary economy is one in which the wealth and income of the individuals re remain constant. Oh, okay, so an, in an income could be negative, presumably. So if um, a person's income, if an entrepreneur's income is positive, then it's, I don't know. It's, it's almost like an follows. entrepreneur is like not necessary or... There'd be no reason to be an entrepreneur in a stationary economy because everyone's income is constant. Yes, yeah, so there are no new opportunities. To yeah, there'd found. be no incentive to do anything better because you know you're only going to make this much money no matter what you do. Right. Huh. Okay. So there is no role for an entrepreneur in a stationary economy, presumably. Which is interesting and um, telling regarding a socialist economy, which mm -hmm. would be, in its perfect state, a stationary economy, right? Like, that it would just be... Yeah, so the next question, is the socialist system compatible with the concept of a stationary economy? Is it relevant? I would say, like, highly, yeah. It is, and it also is not, because they attempt in socialist economies to have entrepreneurship. It's just is owned by the state, right? They're like, the state is the entrepreneur. We're going to build this factory and put people to work. I guess, but there's no single entrepreneur who can take on the, um, the risk of failure. Mm-hmm. Is it relevant? Well, that is <clears throat> interesting. Let's see. I would think a stationary economy... Hmm. So, um, the entrepreneur earns profits or losses. So, in a stationary economy, they could still be earning profits or losses. They would just be constant. Right. And in a socialist system, there would be no entrepreneurs, nor any capitalists to speak of, and profits and losses would be shared among everyone. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I don't know. This is it's a little confusing. Yeah, but this was pretty helpful, I think. Maybe if I go over it again, I'll understand it. Yeah, I'm going to listen to this chapter again. Because I, I even noticed in like the, the ERE section. Yes. Like the, the last summary, it says like, ERE is indispensable for understanding the difference between interest and profit. And the next chapter, I think... The next chapter again is the prices and then we talk about interest so like I don't think this is the last time we'll talk about these imaginary economies right look at some of the titles the subtitles of this chapter so the chapter 15 is the market and then we've got characteristics of the market economy capital capitalism sovereignty of the consumers competition oh my god this is huge freedom <laughs> Inequality, entrepreneurial profit and loss, profit and losses in a progressing economy, 
promoters, managers, technicians, bureaucrats, selective process, individual in the market, business propaganda. Holy. This is a huge chapter. Okay, well, next week we're really going to work that out for us because I need to reread chapter 14 mm -hmm. and do chapter 15, which looks enormous. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is definitely the meat of the book. We got through the, the salad, the first course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the and now we're on to the main. Yeah, this is definitely the main course. Well, the thing that I look forward to the most is if I can really digest and comprehend these chapters, I feel like I've got a really solid understanding of this book mm -hmm. and the concepts within. Right. Okay, cool.